in the biblical text today. Um, we are still in a series on gifts, igniting our gifts, particularly our spiritual gifts. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 will be our time of, of, of preaching and teaching today. And, uh, you know, I, I continue to be reminded of the great importance of us living in community. Uh, given all of the things that happen, it's great to know that our influence and our relationships deeply impact one another and they bring us into greater proximity to one another. Uh, and hopefully, uh, how proximal you get with folks, how close you get with folks, changes you. It makes you radically different than you were before you met folk. Now, hopefully, that is a positive difference. Amen. Uh, anybody met somebody and, and they, they brought the worst out in you? It's like, uh, I could do I could do with a little less touch from you. Uh, but hopefully, as we are together in church and Christian community, the more we hang out together, the more we fall in love with God and with each other. And uh, this is uh, what the 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 work of our gift should do. Now uh, we have. Uh, uh, about 30 verses that I just want to read and and I'm just like is that too much reading amen but but this this passage is such a good passage amen so I figured I, I re will read together a little bit more and let some of the reading be the preaching uh, for us uh, because I do think there is a lot of great good stuff in in this th these verses so so uh, I'm going to invite you uh, to turn to the screen or to whatever translation you have. We're reading from the message translation. And, and uh, this is a, a wonderful e explanation that uh, the Apostle Paul gives around the importance of our gifts and how they relate to one another as they flow from God to us. And, uh, and so there's all kind of great metaphors and imagery in these passages. And so, uh, oh, of course, you can't read that because the light is shining. Amen. Why don't you kill the spotlights and let's see if that will allow us to, to see the, the screen a little bit more since everybody's going to be reading along with us uh, in the name of the Lord. Kill the spotlights, kill the spotlights, kill the spotlights. Did you kill the spotlights? Oh, so maybe it's the under lights. Kill the, kill the floor lights. Just kill all the lights. Is that better? Touch your neighbor, amen. Now we just in the dark, amen. But the light will return. <laughs> Touch your neighbor, amen. All right, here we go. Uh, the scripture says, and we'll just kind of read along together. Apostle Paul is speaking. What I want to talk about now is the various ways, if I say various ways, the various ways God's spirit gets worked into our lives. This is complex and often misunderstood, but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Remember how you were when you didn't know God. Amen. Some of us still don't know God. We still looking for God. We, but, but I want you to know, even if you don't know God, God knows you. <laughs> God's searching for you. God's, God's reeling you in. You, some of us are like, no, God. God's like, just, just keep coming. It's all going to be good. When you didn't know God left from one phony God to another, never knowing what you were doing, just doing it because everybody else did it. Anybody ever been in that place? It's different in this life. God wants us to use our intelligence to seek to understand as well as we can. For instance, by using your heads, you know perfectly well that the Spirit of God would never prompt anyone to say, Jesus be damned. Nor would anyone be inclined to say Jesus is master without the insight of the Holy Spirit. Here we go. Verse number four. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere. But they all originate in God's spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere. But they all originate in God's spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere. But God himself is behind it all. Amen. Amen. God is the original OG up in here, right? It's just, it's, he's the originator of it all. Each person is given something to do that shows, listen, who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. 
The variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. A lot of variety in there, you see, right? All of these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out by one by one by the one spirit of God. God decides who gets what and when. If I take a deep breath, God just decided you could breathe. You ought to clap your hands and thank God for that. Amen, right? God decides and when. Let's keep reading. You can easily see how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of God's one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We each used to, we each used to independently call our own shots, but then we enter into a large and integrated life in which Christ has the final say in everything. This is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. Each of us is now a part of this resurrection body. Refresh and sustain at one fountain, Christ's spirit, where we all come to drink. Listen to this. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves. Labels like Jew or Greek, slave or free, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. That's some good stuff, right? I mean, because sometimes we get caught in our labels and we, we, we forget that God has made us more than our label, more than even our self-description. We need something much more comprehensive. Tell your neighbor, there's more to you than how you describe yourself. Amen. Not trying to diminish your description, but there's more to you than your category. My, my, my. I want you to think about how this all makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. This is one of my favorite parts of the scripture. If the foot said, I'm not elegant like the hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body, would that make it so? If the ear said, I'm not beautiful like the eye, limpid and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head. Would you want to remove the ear from your body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. Let's go down to verse number 25. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. Y'all see why I want to read this now, right? I mean, I, I, I could have tried to summarize it, but I, I, don't, I think I'd have messed it up. Verse 27, you are Christ's body. Tap, tap yourself on the, pat yourself on the chest say, I am Christ's body. Do your hand like this say, we are Christ's body. This is who we are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of the body does your part mean anything. You're familiar with some of the parts that God has formed in the church, which is his body, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, organizers, those who pray in tongues. But it's obvious by now, isn't it, that church, Christ's church is a complete body and not a gigantic 
unidimensional part. It's not all apostle, not all prophet, not all miracle worker, not all healer, not all prayer in tongues, not all interpreter of tongues. And yet some of you keep competing for so-called important parts. And yet I will still show you a more excellent way. Oh, give your neighbor a high five and tell them I'm gifted for this part two. Amen. Gifted. Some of you weren't here for part one, so this may be part one. Amen. But we still gifted for this. Come on, bow your heads and let's pray. God, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we won't sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen, amen, amen. Gifts, you're gifted for this. You have a gift. You have a unique contribution to make. Now, you know, uh, there, there are all kinds of great ways that I like to talk about spiritual gifts as they relate to the body. Um, you know, Joel chapter 2, many of you know that this is one of my favorite, most kind of important framing scriptures of how I imagine ministry and, the, and the, the work of God's spirit in our lives. You know, the scripture says that in the last day, God will pour out God's spirit on all flesh. Everybody say all flesh, right? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. It speaks to the sexism that we often get caught up in. Somebody say amen, right? Your, your, your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. That often talks about the ageism that we can get caught up in. Amen. Folks feel like if you're too young or you're too old, then there's no place for you. But in God's uh, body, there's places for everyone. Uh, your servants or your handmaidens uh, talks about class and even some of our our our, our womanist uh, theologians have recently you know put me on on game that says even sometimes uh, maid servants actually talks about sex workers people who have often been um, caught in a power dynamic of being ab uh, abused so so God is even saying that I'm going to pour out my my spirit on those who are caught in abusive spaces of power. Man, I, I thought that was an interesting, illuminating read. And then the scripture says, and then everyone, somebody say everyone. So, so that just goes to, to, to address all of the groups you hate on that God didn't have time to list, all right? That God is saying everyone in the last days will get a p outpouring of God's spirit. Now, you know, when I, I use these passages, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when I'm training in my uh, work all across the country on how to build powerful, impactful teams of people. And I love this imagery of many members, yet one body. And some people still can't get a hold to it that well. And so I try to go down on their level, and I use, like, contemporary examples. How many of you, you know, remember Voltron? Anybody, y'all remember Voltron? I mean, I see some, some, all right. They, oh, come on, young fella. Thank God, Voltron. Because they brought it back on Netflix. And if you haven't watched it, you should. It's actually pretty good. Voltron is about five lions that are made of the materials of the earth and they have all these great powers amen the power of water the power of land the power of fire the power of of uh, did I say water land fire it's five of them I can't remember all of them amen uh, air touch your neighbor and and then another one amen and 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 they can do great things apart but there is often a, an enemy that requires them all to come together. Because, you know, some of y'all, Avengers, y'all seen Avengers? Yeah, many of y'all, the end game. I'm not going to tell you how the end game ends, but, but I'm just trying to give you an image, right? All of these characters can have standalone movies to fight certain enemies, but when a threat is bigger than the individual hero can fight or defeat. They all come together. I think Captain America, some of them say, Avengers assemble, and then it's time to like avenge the earth. Somebody say amen, right? Or West Wing is another one I like to use. Any of my political uh, junkies, amen. One of my favorite shows of all time. My dream is to have a team like Bartlett's West Wing. You know, or you just have people who just so skilled and you don't even, you just know, man, we about, we about to solve some problems. Amen. We ain't intimidated by no problems that come our way. 
Individually, they have their own office, their own responsibility, but they all depend on one another to accomplish a purpose greater than themselves. Now, we're talking about the gifts that God gives to the church in this same manner that we are a community with lots of differing gifts. By ourselves, we can do amazing things for God. But together, we can do even greater things. Give a little hand praise. First lady just walked on in. Thank God for her. Amen. That's my gift. Sorry. Amen. Just got to acknowledge my gift when she shows up. Amen. Especially in front of other people. Amen. Because it gives me good points. <laughs> and I be needing them. Believe me. Just lots of points. Um, but, but by ourselves, we can do great things, but together we can do even more. And, 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 and I want you to, to, to have a, 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 a kind of a, a, a dual imagination in this sermon because some of us may not feel like this uh, applies to us as relates to church because I'm not like a super involved church person. So this sermon doesn't have much, much value for me. But I want you to even think about this in relation to your family or your vocation or your own job that you can do more with folk than you could by yourself. Now, the risk that we always have is when I start to work with other people. I lose some control. The word I use is quality control. Because if you're a control freak like me, I always think that the best way for something to be done is when I do it all by myself. Anybody else like that? It's kind of like, I don't like working in groups, amen. I, if I'm going to get an F, I want it to be based off of my work. But if I'm going to get an F because you don't know what you're doing, man, then, you know, I'm just kind of like, mm, I'd rather sink or swim on my own terms. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Man, I work with folk like that. I'd be like, you know what? I know you're not thinking about this nearly as much as I am. You show up in the meeting, ain't read, ain't studied, ain't did nothing. You the mo most talking one. <laughs> you know, you sit there and be quiet for a second. At least, you know, that's how I used, when I was in, I'm, I'm, I don't have a long time to ramble. Amen. But I remember when I was in college, you know, if I didn't do my reading, I would not talk very much in class. Unless someone said something that, that triggered a little bit, I'm giving you a little cheating notes, all you college students, amen. You know, it'd be like, oh, you know, they say, you know, I, I remember reading about Augustine City of God, and they was talking about uh, rightly ordered and disordered, and, 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 and they were talking about, you know, uh, values and virtue. And then I jump in, because I remember I read something about virtue like two weeks ago. Oh, yes, virtue. Well, you know, I loved it in this part. Well, you know, I ain't read nothing, amen. It's just faking it till you making it, right? But how many know that will only get you so far? If you haven't done the work, then it will show. That's the risk, right? It's like, I don't want to be connecting to folk like that. I'd rather, you know, live or, live or die, sink or swim on my own. But don't you know that sometimes that kind of radical individuality actually cuts you off from a different kind of wisdom and strength and 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 variance that could help expand your own genius and brilliance and some of us have gifts that work mostly in isolation and they can only go so far they can only take you so far we are always better when we are in relationship with one another. Now, being in a relationship with other folk, what many members, one body, I mean, the, the scriptures makes it very clear. If one part of my body hurts, then the risk of being in a relationship with someone else is I may be injured and it's not even directly my injury. But I got to slow down and let that part of my body get well. Versus just running, you know, I'm just running. 
running, running, running. And, and, then, and, then, and then you realize that you can outrun your body. It was kind of like that with my neck injury. You know, my, I, I got my neck uh, all messed up in a car accident back in August. And, you know, I just thought I could just keep going. You know, because my legs worked okay. <laughs> Man, my, 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 my arms was working okay, but my neck, I didn't know how much I needed my neck. It's like, what's the neck? It ain't nothing to hold my head up. <laughs> Lord, but when that neck pain started traveling up and down my back and into my arms, I was like, loose here, Satan. Why is my neck so significant to the larger part of my body? So I had to go to physical therapy to work on one part of my neck to get the rest of my body operating at a high level. This is who we are. We are one body. Not just the way, but the church universal. Now, there's a lot of risk about talking about the church universal because many folk who say they're part of the church aren't really part of the church. But we just not going to know that until we all get into glory. I just hope I make the cut. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them I hope you make it too. Amen. <laughs> I don't want to be I don't want to be the one Jesus be like, oh, big bride, you <laughs> Hmm, that's why the Catholic doctrine of purgatory is so appealing to so many people. Amen. Purgatory is like, you know, the, you, you don't make it to heaven yet. You got to go to a pit stop and work out all the stuff you didn't work out while you was here. Folk, folk like that. Amen. I don't mind it either at times. Be like, Lord, I hope there's a purgatory because oh, these folk wearing me out. But it is important to realize that the church, God's body, is cosmic. It is not fitting in one denomination. It's not fitting in one building. It is universal. It is without time. It crosses a millennia. We are one body. And so when one part of the body hurts, we all should be cognizant of that pain. It is a macro and a micro reality that we have this obligation to make sure as the church of God in Berkeley, the way has to be a body that functions well as a church, and we have to be connected to the larger body and speak truth to help that body function faithfully as well. And that's hard. Some of us, that's too big. I don't want to be part of all that. Oh, that's fine. Just, just focus on your church. Amen. Let all the rest of us try to figure out how to make sense of this spaghetti we got called the church. Amen. Here in the text, we find a great kind of imagery. And the three things that I think are worthy of you and I to, to, to mention. First off, I want you to always remember that when we are talking about gifts of the spirit, it is always important to remember that your gifts, listen, as described in the text, are always descriptive and not prescriptive because often we can become so so literal in our reading of the text that we try to fit ourselves into super narrow descriptions as if they are prescriptions no they are a categories that broadly give you and I an opportunity to see how God is putting us strategically in each other's lives and together God saved me from folk who think they are everything. Man, there ain't nothing. Me and my, we, we, you know, we be, we be going through our therapy sessions, and 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 and, and it's so helpful to have other voices helping us interpret what each other is saying, because we can often be talking and not understanding, because we get caught up in our own world and we think we are everything we got to remember no we are actually two autonomous human beings working divinely because you know we believe our marriage is a divine arrangement <laughs> some days more than others amen <laughs> but it, th that that is an important truth for us to remember that we are not in all be-alls by ourselves. I need her and she needs me. I need you. You need me. We all need one another to be a body. And these categories help describe how 
the body of Christ is operationalized. Now, in, 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 in some of you who are doing the small group classes, you see how we have tried to use some, some text to help us arrange them. And I just kind of pulled some of these out. Four categories that are often used to help us understand how these gifts are mentioned in the text. We have gifts for shepherding or serving the larger kind of body. Those gifts are often called apostles. Apostles are like people who start churches. People who like have the gift of going and helping to gather and organize and structure churches. Many of the early apostles all were gifted with this gift of being an apostle, someone who helped plant churches. Prophets, people who boldly proclaim they got the, 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 the not only the speaking gift, but the, the, the boldness to boldly proclaim God's word. And even in, ex, in an extended way, Boldly proclaim truth to powers that are trying to oppress God's people and God's creation. Prophets. Now, oftentimes in church, prophets are, are, are more emphasized as like fortune tellers. You know, where it's like, you know, you give me $20 and I'm going to tell you who your booze going to be and when you're going to close on this house and, and how many cars you got coming. And, and, and prophets in the church are often misused. We're not talking about those kind of prophets, amen. There, we, we, I don't honor those kind of prophets. I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, especially when you come to the way. Man, now, you know, what you do somewhere else, I can't do nothing because that ain't my job. You come in here telling me about my, who I'm a Mary, and I was like, oh, I, I think I talk to God away for God. You know, I, you know, I don't, I don't need, who, who's this? Was it Dion Warwick used to be on TV late at night with, with all them, 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 them fortune-telling commercials? And then you come to church with a fortune-teller. I don't know. Evangelists, you have the gift to share the good news of Jesus with other people. Pastor teachers, leading churches, teaching and discipling folks. There's another group of giftings for speaking. Some of us have the ability to make clear ideas that are spiritual or complex. Teaching, encouragement, the ability to to have a, always a good thing to say. How many know that's a gift? You know, you, I, I, I thank God for those kind of people who can always offer me an encouraging word. Not just at church, on my job, in my family. You're just a positive, encouraging person. How many know folk like that who have that gift? And you, you I mean, you know, I don't see a lot of hands, so I'm going to pray that you get some encouragers in your life. Because you need that. You're going to have days where it does feel like the world is falling apart. And we need to be in community with one another where people can offer you an encouraging word, even on your worst day. Even when things aren't well, because things aren't going to be well all the time. Wisdom and knowledge, folk have the ability to have profound insights. Hmm? Gifts for signs and wonders. I love signs and wonders. Gifts like miracles, healing, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Why are these so important? Well, they help expand our imagination. Because often the world shrinks your imagination. You can be in relationships with institutions, systems, people, and your imagination gets smaller. But signs and wonders help remind you that the God of history cannot be put in a box. And a miracle is something that don't happen every day. So sometimes you need miracles to remind you. I, I tell folks, that's just God winking at you. You know, God, I got you. <laughs> like, thank you, Jesus. Amen. I knew I, I shouldn't have met God. Like, mm, I got you. Don't trip. Miracles, signs and wonders to help expand your imagination. I can think of so many times. I don't have time to tell you all the times. But I can think of so many times where God stepped in and did something that only God could do. And I couldn't even take credit for it. What did that do for me? It gave me more confidence that if I put my best effort in, God will expand my impact. 
makes you think you can do more than what you probably can do on your own. Makes you see things that you can't see. And then finally, gifts for service. Gifts that happen in service to one another. So think about this. We have gifts of like administration or shepherding, gifts for speaking, gifts for signs and wonders, and gifts for service. All of these gifts in the body of Christ, both institutionally and in the world. Three things I want you to take away from this sermon. The first thing, your gifts remind you and I that God is active. God is active. In verse number four, it says God's various gifts are handed out everywhere. Somebody say everywhere. This means that even in a world that seems overrun by the injustice and evil and machinations of terrible people, God is still out here using us to point folk to an eternal reality of Love and peace and salvation and justice. Your gifts are important because they remind you and me and us that God is active. Why? Because God's the one handing out the gifts. If God has given you a gift, you should, number one, realize that your value is always at an all-time high. That your value does not go up and down like the stock market. You up one day and down another. No, if God's given you a gift that brings life to others, that helps uh, stabilize and expand the work of the church, it reminds you that you are valuable to God because God is working through you and in you to accomplish God's good pleasure. I love how one writer always says that we are God's arms and legs in the world. Your gifts, whatever they are, all of these lists that we've talked about. Think about it in your church, in your family, on your job, in your community. The many ways that God is using you to remind people that God is everywhere. And how many of you know it's hard to see that God is everywhere at work? Because then you struggle or we struggle, or I struggle with the questions of why is this happening if God is here? Amen. Amen. And I often hear God say, I am here through you to make this not happen. Never underestimate the power of your gift where you are placed together in communion. Maybe God has divinely seated you in this place for you to either catalyze things or wind things down that should no longer be. So first question, is it hard for you to see that God is everywhere, active? For some of us, it's hard. It's difficult. God, how can I see you in all of these different places. Perhaps I want you to think of your gifts being an extension of God's expressions of power. Your gifts given to you and I by the Spirit should allow us to see our actions as an extension of God's expressions of power. That's why I believe that even when we engage in acts of justice and mercy, stewardship, as followers of Jesus filled with the spirit of God, even though our actions may seem similar to others who are not acting as a conscious expression of God's gifting, our work can often be performing two different purposes even though we're doing the same thing. Whereas, you know, I'm serving a hot meal, but if I'm serving the hot meal with an acknowledgement that this is a spiritual extension of God's actions in the world, can you imagine the kind of when you serve, you're passing on conscious blessings. When you heal, you're passing on conscious healing. 
when you teach. And you think they think you're teaching them two plus two plus four. You're teaching them that, but you're also hopefully handing on to them eternal gifts and touches and spiritual power that they may not even appreciate until later on in life. One of the greatest gifts we've had, I think, here at our church, our first few years here, uh, we all adopted one of the schools, uh, the continuation school here in Berkeley. It was called BTEC, Berkeley Technology Academy. Before that, it was called East Campus. And it was like the throwaway school for, our, for many of our black and brown families, mostly black families here in Berkeley for decades. And our church, uh, we had at least half of the staff at the school was from our church. And it was great those years. Hey man, we gotta get back to that. We gotta go take over another school. Somebody say amen. Get back and be involved with these kids. And it was great walking around town and you know, the kids will run up to us. I remember one time, hey man, we was leaving the school and there was a shooting and one of the kids jumped in my wife's car, bleeding. <laughs> and I was in a church van, like two, two cars ahead of her. One of the kids jumped in her car bleeding. And she was like, Michael, he, he just jumped in my car. And I knew who the boy was. I was like, put that boy out your car, girl. No. <laughs> so safe they fe felt with us that even at their most difficult moments, they run to us, even though when we was teaching them, they act like they didn't like us at all. Then after, after they graduated, it was like, they see us around town, they hugging us, they loving on us, they working for us, we working with them. Some of them were in our groups, now they're replicating the teachings we gave them. You never know how you touching the life of people around you will go much further than that single action. And I think that's a spiritual benefit of doing things as an act of God's power everywhere. Does that make sense to everybody? Your gift is a reminder that God is active. Second thing, gifts are for everyone. Somebody said gifts are for everyone. Verse number six says each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone benefits. Everyone gets in on it. Each person in this room and beyond has a special gift that God has given you. Some gifts, as the scripture says, we've read, are more obvious and upfront than others. But neither of them are more important. And you know what? Just because you don't see the gift, it don't mean that the gift is not critically important. And just because you don't understand how the gift works don't mean that the gift is useless. Everyone has a gift. And the scripture goes even further to talk about how our bodies are examples of this. And you know, there are parts of my body that are doing things that I don't even understand. I'm 43 and I still don't understand how my body works. Man, I understand some of it. There are other things like, you know, someone asked me, how, what does your spleen do? I don't know what it does. I don't know. I just don't know. But I know if, if, if my spleen get messed up, I'm messed up. <laughs> Somebody say amen, right? Amen. I, don't know, I don't know how my brain works all the time, but I know when it's not working right. <laughs> when it's exhausted, be like, you need a timeout. Just because you don't understand a thing doesn't mean the thing is not important. Doesn't mean the thing is not indispensable. All of us have gifts, contributions. Listen, the scripture says that show us who God is. When you don't use your gift, you are robbing the world of getting a chance to know who God is. <laughs> Give me a high five and tell them, stop cheating the world. Stop cheating the world. Your own anxieties are keeping people from knowing who God is. And I get it because some of us have been so beat down and told all the time that we're not enough. And, and this is the reason why we can't be using our gift. And, and, and you got to realize that God has given you a gift, not for the haters. You better, you better learn to silence some of these haters now. These folk, these naysayers, everybody always talking about why you can't, why you can't. No, the devil is a lie. I can do all things through the Christ, the God who strengthens me. 
And so if God has given you a gift, even when you fail, I heard Cornell West, he was giving a speech to one of his, uh, one of the commencement people, and he was quoting somebody else. I can't remember who he was quoting. He was like, but when you fail, just fail better the next time. Amen. amen. Fail up. Somebody say amen. amen. The way you fail up is to keep trying. Think of, think of all of the ways in which people fail, but they keep trying. In baseball, if you fail seven out of ten times, you are considered still a success. They only hit the ball 33% of the time. That's an all-star. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? If you hit this little old ball with a bat, 33% of the time, you are an all-star. You go to the Hall of Fame. In basketball, if you miss 50% of your shots, you still an all-star. Perfection is not the prerequisite for using gifts. If you're going to use your gifts, you will fail. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, you ain't nothing but a failure, but that's all right. You got to get out your own mind. Who told you you had to be perfect in order to be God's gift to the world? That's, that's a false narrative. But some of us buy into perfection and we miss out on the incremental ways of growing and learning. And don't you be going to your teacher talking about, Pastor said, if I get... 33% of my, I'm not talking about that. Amen. You got to use context. Somebody say amen, right? But the point still remains is that you will likely fail. But it doesn't mean you should stop. Don't mean you should stop. And we see obvious examples, unfortunately, of that today. I mean, we have arguably one of the most radical failures as the president of the United States. I often just pray that all of us would have as much confidence as him. Because this guy be wrong. He be, he be wrong. I don't even, you know what I'm saying, clock is, is, is right two times. I don't even think he, he matches that. Man, I think the clock just, he just skips over the right time. Or at least That should not disqualify you from trying. The Spirit helps you and I by closing the gaps. The final thing, it's a pretty easy point, but our gifts should force us into interdependence. If the eye don't say to the mouth, how come I don't talk? If the hands don't say to the feet, how come I don't walk? Then why should we be comparing ourselves to one another in ways that fragment us? Our gifts must create interdependence. Your gift fits better next to someone else's gift. Now, the hardest job is to figure out how do I get connected to the right kind of people. Hopefully, at the way, there's enough variety here where that begins to naturally manifest itself. But if it's not natural, that's why we have skilled ministers and helpers to help shepherd us into those connections. Because none of us show up without some of our baggage, some of our disappointments and our pains. I tried to work for people like them, and it didn't work out, so I'm not doing them no more. So I'm just going to sit over here in my corner. I'm going to connect up with people who who I feel most comfortable with. 
I get that because some of us, you know, especially if you're an introvert, I'm an introvert. You may not know this or, th or believe this, but, you know, I'm naturally an introvert. All this other stuff is just performance. <laughs> <laughs> but I can stay in the bed by myself with a TV and a book and feel like Jesus has blessed me beyond measure. <laughs> Somebody say amen, right? So I understand sometimes you only you got about that much to give before you you done. Like, okay, I can't do this is too much. These people talking, you know, it's just, I can't do it. So I, I understand the limitations. That's part of your gift too. But some of us are here to help shepherd us into relationship with one another. As you think through, as we think this through, as you see the problems in the world, ask God, Lord, make me a part of a Avengers, West Wing, Voltron like body where I know that if there are problems too big for me to solve there are others who spring into action with their gifts to help carry me over the rough seasons make me a part of a Christian community where my gifts can help build up our church our community help our larger church global be more faithful doesn't mean everything's gonna be just peaches and cream, sometimes you're going to have a neck injury like I had. You have to go physical therapy. Well, guess what? Spiritual physical therapy is prayer, fasting. You ever go into consecration? Some of us need to get back into some better spiritual shape. Mm -hmm. So these are all the practices that help you and I. Come on, stand to your feet.